Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, the Frederick P. Rose Director of the Hayden Planetarium. And welcome, is this our 18th or 19th uh, annual Isaac Asimov panel debate? Um, this has become a very hot ticket in New York City. And I almost feel apologetic because we can't accommodate everyone who wants to see it. We have to go to a lottery model to get tickets out. And I'm, you know, short of going to a bigger venue or charging more, I would, we're still trying to work this out. But you're here in the audience now, and uh, that's good. That's what I so, uh, did they tell you what tonight's topic is? <laughs> uh, it's a very hot topic uh, on every frontier. We're talking about artificial intelligence. And are people afraid of it? Do people embrace it? Should we be doing it? Should we not be doing it? And it's all over the news. Uh, not the least of which in today's business section of the New York Times, today. This is a paper version of <laughs> the news, the newspaper. <laughs> uh, it's got a sort of an android robot holding the national flag of China, and the title is China's blitz to dominate AI. And uh, I just came back 48 hours ago from the United Arab Emirates, and they have a newly established minister of artificial intelligence. There are countries around the world that see this and recognize it as a way to sort of leapfrog technologies. And I think this is a, there's another, here it is. China's blitz to rule AI meets with silence from the White House. So I just thought I would just say that. Um, uh, I'm just saying. We're trying to burn clean coal. That's what our priorities are. But I'm just saying. Don't get me started. That's <laughs> good. Um, uh, that's the topic tonight. Uh, we, we, we combed the country to find some of the top AI people in the land, and we are delighted for this mix of five panelists uh, we have this evening. Uh, let me uh, first introduce to you, who's right on the wings, uh, Mike Wellman. Michael Wellman is a professor of computer science and engineering at the University of Michigan, and he leads the Strategic Reasoning Group. Mike Wellman, come on. How you like? Thank you. Thank you. And next up, we have a friend and colleague in the astrophysics community who's directed his attention to AI, uh, Max Tegmark. Come on out, Max. <laughs> Professor of Physics and Astrophysics. Yeah. Max, excellent man. He's doing uh, research in AI at MIT, and he's also president of the Future of Life Institute. So Max, welcome. Uh, next we have, we, you couldn't do this without representation from industry, and that's precisely what we obtained for this panel. Uh, John Gamandera, come on out. John? Thank you. John is, uh, he's a senior vice president of engineering at Google, where he leads the Google search and the Google AI teams. So we got Google, in the house. Google in the house. Next, I've got um, Ruchir Purity. Ruchir, come on out. Hello. Ruchir is the chief architect of IBM Watson, and he's also an IBM fellow. So we got him. And we've got uh, Helen Grenier. Helen, come on out. Helen? Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Helen, uh, co-founder of the iRobot Corporation, maker of the Roomba. The Roomba. We all know the vacuuming robot. She's also founder of the drone company Sci-Fi Works. She makes drones now. Is that good or bad? I don't know, we'll find out. 
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. This is our panel, everyone. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so, Mike, you're a professor at University of Michigan. Um, so, what do you what what do you do? Well, I study artificial intelligence from the perspective of economics. You know, economics is a social scientist, so social science that treats its entities, its its agents as rational beings, really ideally rational. Really, uh, art artificial <laughs> intelligence is the subfield of computer science that's trying to make ideally rational beings. So, it's a very natural fit. Can an irrational being make a rational being? Uh, we can do our best. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> and so, uh, so you, you teach a course on this. I, I'm just curious, how do you frame a course around something that's so dynamic and so changing and so uh, uh, emotionally fraught with, so with what, fear? So what, what, what I do and what one does in teaching an AI course is you bring together the standard frameworks and representations and algorithms, techniques that AI people have developed over the years to address thinking-like problems in reasoning, in uh, problem-solving, decision-making, learning, uh, using very standard sorts of algorithms. Now, some people are coming to it from the emotional perspective. I sometimes have gotten comments on my teaching evaluations that said, I signed up for an AI course, and all I got was computer science. That, that's what it is. It's an engineering discipline, uh -huh. uh, and that's the most way to make progress. Excellent. Um, so, uh, Helen, uh, what, what are you about? Um, I'm, I'm all about the robots. You're all about the robots, yeah. <laughs> My brother was a huge Star Wars fan when uh, we were young, and, um, well, for me, it was all about R2-D2, and I've wanted to build robots since I saw uh, Star Wars on the big screen. He had everything, character, strategy, um, uh, loyalty. You tell me Star Wars had like a positive net effect on this world. I think it had a positive net effect on, on, on children. Uh -huh. <laughs> At least one here, yes. Uh, many, many. Uh -huh. um, so uh, <laughs> we've been trying to build robots like this and I th we've had great accomplishments. You know, we've had robots that have been credited with saving the lives of hundreds of soldiers, thousands of civilians. We got the Moomba, which best-selling um, vacuum, not robot vacuum, but best-selling vacuum uh, last year by uh, retail, um, you know, uh, uh, revenue numbers, and um, I think a little bit of a cultural icon, too. And so I think we've come some of the way, but we're not at R2-D2 yet, so I think some of the debate is about w w where it needs to go. So you, you co-founded the company iRobot, which mm -hmm. I think was the name of an Isaac Asimov novel, yeah, and, the, uh, and that company invented the Roomba, great word, by the way, Roomba. Yeah, that's just good. That was very good. I like words. So we, we asked our engineers what we should call it first, and they said, um, the Mock Master 2000, the Cyber Suck. <laughs> that's probably uh. the best mocking dollars that we ever spent to get that name. You got to. So that costs you money to get that yeah. word. Okay. Um, does your Roomba count as a kind of AI, would I believe, you say? I, I, I believe so. People are starting to use uh, AI to be synonymous with deep learning techniques. But for roboticists, there's a lot of tools in the tool bag. Roomba runs something called behavior control, which was invented by one of my business partners at, at iRobot, where we have a lot of behaviors that all run in parallel. The first generation, it you know, wouldn't fall down the stairs. It did obstacle avoidance. It followed the walls. The latest generation, I think it was something like um, 13 years later, it does full navigation using a camera system, so visual slam techniques. OK, um, has your Roomba ever killed anyone? <laughs> you know, we, we actually... Wait, wait, there's only a yes, no, no! That's, I, the no sentence, I... yes or no. Certainly no, okay, but we you. actually, you know, you know, it's product design. You have to look at what are the ramifications it could have. Like the worst thing we came up with, maybe it goes into someone's fire, pulls out the embers and sets the place on fire. Has never happened. And by the way, they usually have hearts that keep a Roomba, a Roomba out <laughs> and screens. <laughs> but there's a lot of, you know. But in the future, you're... <laughs> no Roomba's killed anyone. <laughs> okay. Um, Ruchir, Ruchir Purila? Did I say that correctly? Yep. Yeah, thank you. You've been at IBM for more than two decades. Yep. And so you're, you're uh, uh, I'm just curious, uh, before we get to Watson, which you have uh, something to say about, uh, our earliest memories of IBM getting this game, I think it was Deep Blue, where uh, it was a chess program that beat the world's best um, ch chess player. Uh, what made it so good in its day? 
I think it's from a from the point of view of so I've, I've dealt with optimization algorithms for pretty much quarter of a century, and and where optimization algorithms. Optimization yeah, so algorithms. this would just so that it can make it can calculate as uh, quickly and efficiently as possible towards a, a, a goal. Yeah, it really, uh, there were three things that came together, actually. So search algorithms, really smart evaluation criteria, and the third one is really sort of massively parallel computing application as well. So those three things came together to really give rise to something that, you know, that wowed people. <laughs> Uh, it's an application of technology, again, algorithms to coming sort of together from three points of view to give rise to an application that's really wrong. So, but uh, could Deep Blue do anything other than play chess? <laughs> so interestingly, the Deep Blue was, uh, we have at IBM, we have something called grand challenges, and we pose these problems to really move the field forward. Uh, Deep Blue was a, a grand challenge posed to the scientists at IBM. Similar to that, actually, Jeopardy was also a grand challenge. But Jeopardy, uh, was, but Jeopardy wasn't Deep Blue. No, Jeopardy certainly wasn't Deep Blue. Yeah, well, but that was Watson, correct? Yes. That's... We'll get to Watson in a minute. Okay. I just want to work my way up to that. Um, and I think I have some, some first-hand knowledge of your grand challenges. I was once invited to address a retreat among IBM engineers where they were given cash rewards for their innovation. Um, do they still do that? Uh, certainly, we, 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 have, we encourage our employees and scientists to really you know, get, the, get the innovations out there and get the innovative juices flowing, absolutely. Yeah, I was delighted, because each one got recognized, they got a certificate, the CEO was there. Yep. I mean, yep. it was, it was very, very much taken seriously. Yep. yep, we still do that. Right, very good, we'll, we'll get back to you. John, I, I, I think I messed up your last name. Gam, Gam Andrea? Jan Andrea. Jen, and oh, John Andrea. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, John Andrea. So uh, you, you represent Google on this panel. And could you just tell me, remind us what is the game of Go, and then tell us what AlphaGo is. Sure. Um, so Go is this ancient uh, oriental board game, which is harder than chess. And, uh, oh. and the reason it's harder than chess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go. And the reason it's harder than chess is because at any given. But just to be clear, part, it's, a, it's a board game. You didn't say that. It's a board sense. game. Yes, yeah, sorry. You, you it's, said it's, it's a war game. No, it's a board game. It's a board. Game. It's a war board game. It's, it's, a, it's not like it's a strategy game. Weapons and things. No, no okay. it's just, there's only two pieces: black pieces and white pieces. Okay, go. And the reason it's hard, and people have been playing this game for 2,000 years, and it's highly revered in Asia, uh, and people are paid full-time jobs to be professionals at this game. Um, and the reason it's hard is because any given position on the board, um, there are many, many more positions that you could take. So you can't use brute force approaches to figure out how to play the game. So intuition is a very big role. So, so the, 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 the recent systems that have become very, very good at this game, you could even say superhuman at this game because they beat the world champions, um, they're doing something fundamentally new, and people look at that and use words like intuition, which is not a technical word. Um, and, and uh, you know, so, so there's something going on. <laughs> who, who invited you to this? <laughs> but but it's, it's a serious issue, because I think when people use words like that, when, when, when a, a, a chess grandmaster is beaten by Big, uh, Deep Blue, or when the, the world champion in Go was beaten uh, first in Korea, Lee Sedol, um, it's an emotional toll on that player because they've spent their entire life perfecting uh, their ability to play this game, and then a machine comes along and appears to beat them using, and the, the words that are used are like creativity or intuition, or that's something I didn't expect it to play. And so I think that adds to the mystique of AI when actually what's going on underneath is uh, engineering. Plain so a brute force. It, no, in the case, in the, case of, uh, the AlphaGo system, it was a combination of training and new algorithms to do so-called deep learning, which I'm sure we'll... Okay, so, so uh, AlphaGo was trained on previous games that had been played? Yes, there's two versions of it. The, the one that won the World Championships uh, was trained on all human games that it could get its hands on and then played itself. So it basically practiced after it had learned, how to, uh, learned the... How the, quickly could it play itself and finish a game? Uh, well, we do it in the cloud with thousands of computers, so it can do it um, you know, thousands of times at the same time. So... Okay. Very fast. Very fast, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then most recently... And there it's was... just in the cloud. 
In the cloud, that's right. somewhere. Okay. Lots and lots of That's computers. the computing cloud, not the storage that's cloud. That's right, the computing cloud. Yeah, yeah. So recently there's been a version of this called AlphaGo Zero, and the interesting thing about this... So that, that's an up, upgrade. This, well, it's, uh, a, it's a later version, and what they tried to do with that is the researchers tried to see if they could learn to play Go without looking at any human games. And uh, the publishers... That way it would come up with stuff on its own. Yeah, and the publishers all, sorry, AlphaGo Zero was actually better than the one that learned from humans, and it also plays chess very well. <laughs> I'll try to find other questions for you <laughs> later. We'll see. <laughs> Doesn't do Jeopardy, though. Okay, so that learned... So, so it taught itself, basically, yeah. and was not biased by the creativity of any human game that had previously been played. And so that you play that game against another, AlphaGo, another copy. and it beat AlphaGo. Yeah, that's right. So it's extra badass. Yeah, the, ga <laughs> the ga games are a special, a special thing because games have an objective score, and so it's mm -hmm. not—it's actually a good test for this uh, this level of the current technology. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Max, uh, we go back. Great to have you. This is like your fifth time here in the museum. Uh, it's not even your first Asimov panel. So, thanks, thanks for showing up again. Um, you recently published a book, Life 3.0. It's your mm -hmm. third or fourth book. I've been second. Second, okay. It feels like three just books. Take, they just take so long to read. That's what it so is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, your first book was uh, Mathematical Universe, and thinking of all of the universe as, as a simulation, basically. And we had you on the simulation panel last year. Uh, Life 3.0, what's, what's that about? It's, uh, well, I'm, uh, my day job right, is, is working at, at MIT doing AI research from a physics perspective these days. So, so I, I like to take a sort of step back and look at things. If, and if a you, cosmic perspective. Yeah. And if you uh, look a little beyond the next election cycle and all these near-term AI controversies about jobs and stuff like that, and then uh, it's pretty natural to ask, well, what happens next? What happens if, if all these folks succeed and ultimately make machines that can do everything we can? Uh, the earliest life that came along, I call it 1.0, because it was really dumb stuff like bacteria that couldn't learn anything in its lifetime. And then I call us 2.0, because we can learn. <clears throat> and oh, you're referring to the evolutionary achievements in the tree of life? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and <clears throat> what comes next? I think uh, we should think about this, because if, if the only... The only uh, strategy we have is to say, like, hey, let's just build machines that can do everything cheaper than us. What could possibly go wrong? You know, <laughs> I think that's just pathetically unambitious and lame. You know, we're an ambitious species, Homo sapiens. We should aim, we should aim higher. We should say, like, how can we use all this technology to empower us, not to overpower us? Uh, okay. We'll need more of that, I'm sure, as this conversation progresses. Uh, uh, let me get back to Mike. Mike, does, um, could you remind us about the Turing test, what that is? Sure. Uh, Alan Turing back in, in 1951. Uh, uh, he's, the movie, uh, <laughs> The uh, Imitation Game, is, is, is a biopic on him. Is it, is it right? And it does depict the, the Turing test uh, a bit. So back in 1951, uh, he proposed this thought experiment, uh, realizing that to try to get people to understand uh, machines as being able to think would require defining thinking, and that would be very controversial. Uh, so he set up a, uh, this thing that became called the, the Turing test. That is, uh, see if you could have a machine have a dialogue with somebody. Uh, and convince them that they're a, a, a person rather than a machine. If, if a person ha in an interrogation uh, could not tell the difference between whether they're speaking with a machine or a person, then you might as well say it's, it's, it's thinking. This is really audacious in, in 1951. Think about what machines were like back then. People hadn't even thought, about, thought of word processing yet, and they were thinking about, uh, about AI. Uh, that test, I think, has been very uh, useful as a thought experiment. The field of AI has never really generally accepted that as the goal of AI or uh, the definition of, of, of AI. Uh, but well, certainly, is that because you've evolved past that? We do have machines that sound like they're not machines but people. So once you hit that goal, you say, oh, we need a better goal. And are you just moving the, the goalpost? So we, we haven't hit the goal. So it turns out Turing didn't realize that it would be easy to fool a lot of people, even without <laughs> uh, being very good at thinking. It reminds me, was uh, it a New Yorker comic <laughs> where two dogs are at 
computers, and one turns to the other and says, the good thing about the internet is that no one knows you're a dog. <laughs> That's right, and, and no one knows you're a bot either, mm -hmm. and that is uh, a potential way that AI is going to uh, uh, you know, affect us and uh, be ubiquitous. So it is quite relevant uh, to try to impersonate uh, people. Uh, we, we, that we use that as a gateway to a lot of uh, internet activities. You do a CAPTCHA, that is called a computer automated something Turing, I, I forget the, the exact uh, oh, the, acronym. The T in CAPTCHA is stand for Turing? Uh, yes. Oh, I didn't uh, know that, cool. Um, it, or, or, it's basically you, you have to tell the, the We've machine all that, you're, that you're a human. Yeah. Uh, so find something that only humans can do. And of course, that bar keeps on uh, moving all the time. So it's quite relevant to try to impersonate for uh, the, the Alexas and the series in the world are trying to be as human-like as possible. Uh, uh, in, in films, we try to put, and, and, and video games, realistic characters uh, all the time. So it's a, it's, it, it still speaks to us, even though it's not the whole story about AI. But, so your point is, we did so well with the t satisfying the Turing test very early that it just wasn't good enough distinct, uh, a, a discriminator for well, the AI that people were seeking. Well, I guess I would say that being like a, uh, specifically like a human is only one way to be intelligent. And you could be superhuman in many other ways, and you don't stop when you reach human level performance in particular tasks, because the goal is not to be like a human, the goal is to make ideally rational intelligence that could do all sorts of things. Uh, so, uh, Helen, the, with a company you co-founded called iRobot, uh, could you tell us about, is it the three laws of robotics by Isaac Asimov? Yeah, definitely. The um, uh, you know robots cannot. The three laws: one, the robots uh, cannot hurt humans or cause humans to come to harm through inaction. Robots cannot. Um, that, that was one. That was one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so so robots they have cannot to obey harm orders. you, and their inaction also can't harm yeah, you. Yeah, they have to obey orders unless it conflicts with number one. And the third one is um, they cannot harm themselves unless it uh, conflicts with number one and number two. And there's one he added uh, later on, the zeroth one, which is uh, robots cannot cause harm to humanity or through inaction uh, have humanity come to harm. So it, it generalizes it up from the individual. Oh, yeah. Human the yeah, well, they, he made that the zero floor, so he, he stuck it in the, in the front the zero <laughs> when he floor. thought of it. Okay. <laughs> um, but what's amazing about it is he, he started writing the iRobot books in 1940. Um, practical transistors weren't invented till 1947, so, I mean, one of the reasons we're also honored to be here at the Asimov Memorial Debate is I think we can, can speak for the panel that we're all huge, huge fans of what he was writing about, especially, um, you know, way, way back. Well, just consider that he's written mm -hmm. about uh, on topics uh, quite diverse. So no matter what subject we have here, mm -hmm. uh, there are books that he wrote about it. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> every panel we've but ever AI, had on- AI is a really good one for him. On any subject. <laughs> um, so I read that by Asimov when I was a kid. So. That, that, that said, people ask me, are you putting those in the robots? And you know, the short answer is, they're great as a literary device. They're a little bit more tricky to program. <laughs> And so, um, unfortunately, the answer is uh, uh, that state of technology is not ready for those types of abstract rules yet. But they're nice guidance, just the philosophical guidance, I guess. Um, I have a very practical view. I think you know, the laws, if you state them now, might be um, a, a ro robots can save people, they have saved people, and they could save a heck of a lot more people. You know, it, it might be that robots, um, um, well, plus, the, the military would not be obeying those laws. Yeah, exactly, right. exactly. And in reality, because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a businesswoman as well as um, a, a, a robot lover, you know, robots are not going to hurt don't, don't people. Don't say robot lover. That, that just I am? doesn't... I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I just uh, find some other phrase. Robot. I'm a robot enthusiast. There like you that. go. Thank you. <laughs> um, Thank you. Ro robots are not going to hurt people. They're not going to, um, uh, you know, hurt themselves. They're not going to... Um, you know, do these things because they're going to be either scrapped, they're going to be sent back, or someone's going to be sued. And so from a business standpoint, the robots are going to be safe to operate. Uh, one of my favorite, well, no, uh, a video that I found amusing uh, was a cat riding around on a Roomba. You know, that got so many views and I have no idea why. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like tens of millions of views, right? It's crazy. But, I mean, um, if, if the room were big enough for me to sit on, I would do that. That's, that's, wouldn't you? That's, that's, that, that's was fun. N that was not in our brainstorming sessions when we thought about all the applications <laughs> for, for robots. 
Um, so, uh, Bouchier, the could you t could you get us from Deep Blue to Watson? What what happened in that transition? And and if we can remind people why we all know about Watson, there was the big the big contest that you guys entered it in. So certainly, I mean, let me pick up the thread from from the chess and the go and you know <laughs> let's <laughs> let, let's, okay, let's continue. make this interesting actually <laughs> continue <laughs> no, just finally they're all by the way deep blue beat kasparov when you when google had 10 employees true. okay so just like true. just true. like where were you true. all right Absolutely true. okay okay did, did I get you on that one? Yes, okay, thank, got it. Got thank you. Back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so take us there. So the journey continues from from the point of view of uh, chess um, game that beat Kasparov to you know we went on to okay what is next and obviously and Kasparov language, was the world champion at the yes, time at, at the time and and natural language which is so fundamental to humans actually and the intricacies of natural language um, as as we've been, sort of, at least there's one fundamental trait that, that human, humanity has, which is just the proliferation of language, the, the advent of language itself. So we decided that will be the next leap that we are going to make. And there is no game better than Jeopardy that captures that intricacies. So we pose that as a grand challenge. Jeopardy, not, not only language, but culture. But culture, actually. Yeah, it's not a calculation anymore it in is a traditional sense. It is certainly not a calculation anymore. And the way the questions are posed are so nuanced uh, that you, know, you really are dealing with, at this point in time, not just a calculation machine and simple uh, evaluation criteria and search algorithms and, and parallel computing, but really understanding language question and answers, and the way we interact as human beings. So that was really the, the advent of the next challenge. Because once we are able to solve that, the implications are phenomenal in terms of the benefit it can bring to, to us as a society, which is where we took that level two. The first thing that sort of we started right after Jeopardy was the, the applications of that technology to the health domain, which is so fundamental to, to all of us. So right from chess game, the next challenge is really addressing fundamentals of what defines us as, as humans in terms of communications, addressing those intricacies, and then applications of that abound. To serve needs in actual society. Uh, absolutely. So uh, Watson, in principle, can become the best doctor ever because mm. Watson can read all the research papers and then, attack, and then, then interpret symptoms in the context of what is known worldwide rather than just what one doctor happened to learn. Uh, absolutely, and at least the way we think about it is really not, it's not about, you know, does it become the best doctor, but as we all know, no physician, single physician has the time, even if they have certainly the intelligence to figure all of this out, they don't have the time to figure all of that out. And as Max was saying, it's really about empowering, um, you know, professionals. Uh, than necessarily overpowering them. And really, Watson is about empowering the society as opposed to overpowering it. And that's why I really think about it's bringing capabilities whereby, yes, it can read millions of, of studies and millions of, of uh, trials that may be going on. And there are some well-publicized cases as well where it had actually saved you know, patients either in North Carolina or Tokyo or a study that was published more recently in India as well. But it's from our point of view, it's really about bringing the technology together with the human beings, what we call augmented intelligence. Uh, so in all, in all fairness to our understanding of this, Watson only knows what is available on the internet, correct? Yeah, w Watson only knows what is actually being fed to it, let's say it that yeah. way, whether it is available on internet or it is private information. So how does Watson know what is fake news or not? <laughs> You can make a super machine that cannot distinguish the two. Well, apparently humans can't either. But um, in principle, we, we educated can make a judgment. Will Watson be in a position to make that judgment? I think, with, at least regarding fake news, the, the question really is on we are all pushing the boundaries of that technology, and yes, the machines need to be trained, and they can really help us given what has gone on actually in the last couple of years. They can, once they are actually, you bring that technology to bear in terms of realizing there is a problem, you can actually you know, correct for it. 
So it's not about whether Watson can distinguish it today or not. Once you realize the problem, you can actually start working on technologies that can start deciphering that much better, thereby helping us as society because, you know, just what is going on overall. Uh, so, but you, that, from what you've described, Watson would still be shy of this, um, this holy grail of um, just thinking stuff up on its own without reference to, I mean, when you think of the, the most creative people there ever were, sure, there's some foundation from where that you could trace that creativity, but for many of them, there's a spark and something new comes out of them that had no precedent. So from what you describe, Watson is capable of, of um, digesting pre-existing knowledge, but in its current state, or at least the state we're familiar, it is not inventing something new. Yeah, it's, it's certainly the, the purpose of the technology today is really not about that, that spark in itself, although it will find, I, I, would, I would in particular find out, it'll find insights that you didn't know existed, actually. Okay. Although they were hidden in there, you didn't know existed, so it may be a aha moment for you, I got it, but still, it existed there, it didn't, so it will actually do that, but yeah, it wouldn't get that the notion you are saying, hey, that was Spark. No, it doesn't have. Uh, so John, uh, tell me about the future. I, I, I we could spend a whole panel on this, but I just want to just put it on the table briefly. <clears throat> uh, what, what's the role of AI in the future of autonomous cars? And I know you guys are working on this. You, ha yeah, you entered yeah. certain... Uh, autonomous car challenge, you, your, your yeah, we, company. Yeah, we, we have a division of Alphabet that works on this. Um, and just to be clear, the holding company is Alphabet, yeah. and Google is one of several companies under Alphabet, That's right. and one of those companies were tasked with making the autonomous one car. One of those companies is called Waymo, and they're one of the many companies that are making autonomous mm -hmm. cars. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a super hard problem. Um, I think people have been working on it seriously for more than a decade. Um, they're making progress. Uh, these cars have driven millions of miles with uh, very small numbers of incidents. Um, but they're still pretty constrained. They're we're more accurate than a human driver, but they are limited in where they can go. So, for example, they, they, the, the kinds of streets that they can drive on, the cities, and so on and so forth. Um, but the technology is progressing fairly dramatically. I'm pretty confident to say that we will have fully autonomous cars for most of the large car manufacturers in, within a decade. And uh, what role does AI play in that? Or is it just is it just really good programming? Well, it's machine learning. So you know, you, you, these systems have a lot of computers on the car. They can can detect a you know a stop a stop sign, or can figure out you know that there's a, a an impediment in the road, or a kid just ran, ran into the road, or there's a cyclist. In California, we have this weird thing where um, motorcycles are allowed to drive between the lanes. We have many, lanes. We have many weird things yeah. in California. Uh -huh. um, but motorcycles are allowed to drive between the lanes of the cars, and so for the computer to actually understand what's going on here and figure out what's safe and what's not safe is actually quite hard. I think one of the things going to happen here is even if you don't don't see millions of autonomous cars like in three years, most of the new cars that you buy will have semi-autonomous features in them, like automatic braking or telling Which you Which we're all accustomed to and expected on yeah. the next cars yeah. now. So I think, I think this technology kind of comes in increments. It's not like a big bang thing, you know? Um, and, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just echo this comment about augmentation, because the, you know, the phrase AI it means so many different things to so many different people that it's really hard to kind of pin down what it is. But the idea of augmented intelligence has been around for a very long time. A lot of the ideas we have in computing today came from the work of Doug Engelbart back in the 50s, and he had been, you know, uh, describing computers as being a tool a tool that can help the doctor look through more information, that can help pinpoint something in an x-ray, not something that would replace the doctor. And that's how we think about Which it. Which is Max's point. Not be just, uh, what, what, what's the two words you put together? Oh, empowered versus overpowered. Overpowered, yes, very, very good, I like that. Uh, could, you, could you describe for us um, what's the difference or what is the ascent from uh, AI to general AI, because we hear this term general AI, yeah. and what's going on there? What, what, what have we been talking about so far, and is, if it's not general AI, what is? That's, it's really important to be clear on what we mean by intelligence. As you mentioned correctly, John, different people mean, mean different, different stuff, stuff, right? I think it's a really good idea to go in the footsteps of Helen here and, and make a very broad definition of intelligence. So even Roomba is intelligence. And just define intelligence simply as ability to accomplish 
complex goals. You know, so Roomba has very narrow intelligence, really good at vacuum cleaning. Uh, today we have. Uh, Was that a diss on? The I am a proud Roomba owner, and we, we have the Roomba can carry cats around. Okay? Yeah. For, for all we know, the Roomba is like the Uber for cats in the house. Yeah. Okay. So, Wouldn't that be cool if cats could like get the Roomba to come and take them around? So uh, get the Roomba to open a door for them. Yeah. That's right. So uh, if you so today right, we have many areas. So if you define intelligence as ability to accomplish complex goals, then. Uh, there are many areas today where machines in narrow domains are already much better than us. Not just vacuum cleaning and, and high frequency trading and multiplying large numbers together and stuff like that, but also now in playing chess and playing Go and so on. But no, no machine today that no we have built, machine. No, no single machine, not even the whole internet combined, can do, has the broad intelligence of a human child who, given enough time, can get quite good at anything. So th this is what's meant by artificial general intelligence, or acronymed AGI, which has been the holy grail of artificial intelligence ever since Marvin Minsky and McCarthy and others founded it, the, came up with the, the whole, founded the field in the 60s. And, yeah, but, uh, but Helen, now, uh, Helen, you, you, you you come to this from a product, a consumer product point of view, and I want to get back to what you just said. Mm -hmm. People who are making AI want to sell something. So they'll sell you something that cleans the room, that drives the car, that does any one of the things that help our lives. Who's going to buy something that has general intelligence? Well, and, and, and will the general intelligence be as good at the pieces of it as the specific <laughs> products that that industry would be making for that one need that you have? Oh yeah, by, by definition. So people say, that they think that machines will never be able, there will always be jobs left for humans. They're just saying by definition that, that AI researchers will fail to build artificial intelligence, because that's the def very definition of it, that uh, machines can do everything better than us. And many people, like, like I have I, had many, many conversations with your... I, I'd like to point out yeah, there's, yeah, a, just there's a mechanical sentence. and a sensing component as well as the, you know, what you're calling AGI. <laughs> mechanical and a sensing element to, to make these machines better. Um, sure. Oh, but anyway, but so the, you, can have, you can have software, but if it doesn't have the <laughs> physical means to enact what it's supposed to, it's just a box. No, no, it could do some great stuff. Like yeah. you could feed it a photograph and it could you know, tell you if you have breast cancer or something like that, right? But it's not going to go out and sweep your floors. Yeah. <laughs> but I, th I think the final word on, on definition should go to Shane Legg one of the leaders of Google DeepMind, because he coined the phrase, and he simply meant something that can do the same information processing that the human brain can do, and if you hook it up to good enough robots, which I'm sure you can build, then it can do great stuff. And so, so that's the goal of certain companies, like Google DeepMind, for example, to try to build that, and that's why they keep trying to push the envelope, right? And with, uh, but wait, but I gotta go to my three uh -huh. ind uh, industry people. What does it mean to buy something that has general AI? How, what, am I, what do I do with that? Well, do I say, make me the best cup of coffee, drive me to my office, what's the square root of two, and I mean, in practice, is that a thing? So in principle, and this is highly speculative, but in principle, an AGI could build any other kind of AGI, and therefore, could build you any machine you wanted to build. And that's what people that's worry about. That's when, when we all die. When people, no, 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 no. That's, <laughs> that's when a, a class of people who call themselves transhumanists would say that humans would evolve. And I personally don't believe in this. I, I see no evidence that it's going to happen, but that's the source of a lot of the ethical right. discussion exactly. about this topic. Uh, Mike, speaking of ethics, uh, could you uh, tell us about the, the uh, trolleyology? <laughs> and so, what role AI can play in assisting our reasoning there. So probably many of you have heard about trolley problems. This, was, this became popular um, uh, in psychology to pose ethical dilemmas to people and see uh, how they react. And the, 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 there's many variations of it, but the standard kind of story is a trolley is going down a track and it's about to hit uh, or kill three people. And then you notice that there's a switch and you could make it go over to another track where there's only one person and you could choose to kill that other person instead of the first three, would you do it? And I... I wait, wait, the, so, the, so, the, so the, the dilemma there is somebody's going to die no matter what. 
you either can not touch it, then the trolley kills three people on its own, or you can intervene and actively kill one person. Right. Now, right. I'm not a psychologist, uh, but I think it, it, it seems to be a kind of a silly question to ask people because humans can really never get, I think, into a mental state where they can really believe that with certainty, if this action, ha if I take this action, I'll kill this one person for sure, and the other action. There's always this uncertainty. There's always questions about what to blame with. It's, it, it's not actually a realistic situation. Um, so the question is, will AIs actually maybe, was it more realistic for them perhaps? Uh, could a, an autonomous vehicle be in a situation where uh, all of a sudden a bicyclist runs in front of it and has a chance to swerve and, and, and do some other damage, and will it have to weigh that? It would have to take out the vegetable cart first. <laughs> and then find out what else it does. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, so, so will they have to be coded in them what the solutions are to those dilemmas? You know, when it does happen... Right, right, right. So know. that implies that humans get together, figure out a solution, and you hand it to AI. But that's not the point of AI. The AI is going to have some higher intelligence than we do. And that's why I'm curious. So, so, so I, you I bring AI to that problem... Is it going to give different answers than we would? And then we said, oh my gosh, we never thought about it that way. Let's do it that way. So I think this is a thread that's going in some of the discussion here. Uh, actually, no, AI, the idea is we want to give, the, for the humans to give the AI the values. And the AI is, is concerned with making decisions and taking actions to promote those values. So ultimately, we are saying, you know, we value life. We value, that, that's, that's part of what the robot laws are for. There are the, no <laughs> robot laws. But, they are science fiction. Just. Yeah, you you want to make sure we no, 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 no. But it's it's <laughs> because exist. because so the danger is that they would be weaponized by the party that is programming them and is is controlling them. Not that they're going to all of a sudden decide to uh, get rid of the humans. That's you know that's not the source of the danger. For you know with respect to the the kind of trolley problem situation in an, in this hypothetical autonomous vehicle, when it does happen that a car one of these cars runs over a bicyclist, and it'll happen, I, I think, much less frequently than humans do it today. Um, We'll take the black box. I hope they're engineers that they have a black box that captures everything that was in their senses all that time and it's very secure so they can't lie about it. And then we'll be able to dissect it and we'll say, you know, you made this decision. Why did you do that? And you say, it might say, well, I, I hit the bicycle because if I swerved to the left, I would have run over uh, a, you know, a, a child. Or, or if it said, well, I did that because uh, if, I, if I swerved too fast, I'd wake up the passenger. Then you'd say, no, that was the wrong decision. That was not what we, that was not what we meant for you to, for you to do. It's, 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 it's still better than what the Tesla said yeah, a couple I, of years ago. If I ago. leave it, say, yeah, yeah. don't wake me up for any reason. <laughs> That's right. And so, it's the robot's job to obey me. Exactly. This is exactly an answer. That, that, so this is part of the danger of AI is that the unintended consequence of the specification of the values won't hit what you really care about. Uh, uh, let me ask Google and mm -hmm. IBM here. Uh, in your efforts in this, I don't want to call it a race, but let's call it an a, um, exploration, uh, is there a tandem sort of ethical group? At, uh, let me start over here in IBM. Are, are, is, there a, is anyone thinking about the ethics of what AI would do? if you achieve this goal? Because we certainly have sci-fi movies, and none of them, it never ends well, okay? In any of them. Mm -hmm. Any of them. <laughs> yeah, so, so certainly we, uh, we were one of the first companies to actually bring principles of, of ethics and responsibility to AI. It's captured in, in, in sort of a bold ways in what we do overall on, 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 on the information we have. But most importantly, there are three fundamental tenets we go by as it pertains to AI. One is building AI with responsibility. Uh, second one is building AI with, that's unbiased. And the third one is building AI that's explainable. I think those are the fundamental tenets that, that we drive and strive towards. Um, and we have, in our research teams, we have significant number of, of people and scientists and, and efforts that really try to drive our, our the AI services that we offer, the solutions that we build with, with tremendous number of businesses around to, to drive them with those three principles. Uh, and obviously, I think we all know the, the way AI techniques work these days, they are driven a lot by the data. Um, and, and you are as good as, as we were just discussing before, you are as good as the data that you are fed. Um, and detecting bias in the data itself 
is actually one of the more important research and technical challenges. And having techniques that are able to de-bias that data as well in terms of when you are learning, you know that there is bias in the data, or be able to de-bias it so that you can build models that are actually unbiased. So that's why I said we have three fundamental principles that we go with. So it's sort of very formal and, and ingrained in the principles through which, through which we are driving AI. Uh, speaking of bias, John, if I remember correctly, uh, there, were in, there were some fascinating studies recently where Google facial recognition software was not at, as good as I, at identifying black people as it was with white people. And then they found out yep. that just white people programmed it. So that's so. Um, I was so actually, maybe that's just kind of obvious I, at that point. But but that would I, that would I think count as a bias. I, I was actually at lunch with one of the authors of that paper today. They, they haven't actually measured our systems. They measured other people's systems. But it's a serious issue, and I think that. Um, so it wasn't your official it was, recognition. It wasn't. It, it wasn't ours. But uh, this 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 issue of bias in machine learning so systems I'm, I'm, is so, super I'm sorry important. to have implicated. No, no, no you. it's okay. It's okay. So mm -hmm. I, I mean, we think that this is at least for the next few years, the most serious ethical issue. Um, you know, I, don't, I think this AGI stuff is years, decades away, so I, I, we d I don't spend very much time on this. But this question of if you're building learned systems, machine learned systems, learning from data, if your data is biased, you're going to build biased systems. And this could be everything from whether to give somebody a mortgage or what their credit score prediction would be, or there are people selling systems now that uh, are used by courts to predict recidiv recidivism rates. And they're not explainable, and it's not entirely clear what data they use to train them. And we think this is just unethical. So it's garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. And level. so. And we know so, that one was very biased. Yeah. yeah. So, so m many of our companies work together outside of the commercial realm with academia, but also in nonprofits, um, looking at this question because we, we we're really worried about building systems that give a bad name to all this machine learning. So, but it, so in all of your efforts, uh, how would you characterize the sort of the ethical? A dimension of what's going on. You have people, yeah, so are they philosophers, are they psychologists, what are they? Uh, no, they're usually uh, data scientists and researchers who are looking for uh, systemic bias in the systems, in the data that we're using to train the systems, but we have, we have okay, significant so, efforts. With, so with I get the, the bias companies. part, but how about the trolley car part, where there's, where we, will the AI have the values we care about if it will properly serve us? If the AI achieves consciousness, yeah, I mean, and it comes our, up with values of its own. I mean, our company has very few situations, autonomous vehicles would be one, where we have to actually struggle with these issues. Mostly we're worried about recommendation systems uh, giving bad recommendations to people. Um, okay. Or ranking systems giving bad results to questions that you asked. But um, this is moving fast as a field. I, I think as a field is moving fast, and I think academia is, is now got entire classes on uh, mm -hmm. you know, AI ethics and machine learning ethics, and I think society is responding in an appropriate way because we're worried about this stuff. Uh, so Max, yeah. you're president of the, the tell me of the, the Future of Life Institute. Future of Life Institute. It sounds very new agey, by the way. Oh, future of Life, we're for it. Fut okay. <laughs> <laughs> we would like it to exist. Not a controversial, you know, put that on. You would uh, think. Put that on Twitter and then people would argue you with would it be for surprised. sure. Yeah. Uh, so um, could you tell me the, the, the difference between an is and an ought, philosophically, and how that matters in AI? Yeah, you know, it basically Was it Hume who did, who did this? <clears throat> but one of the philosophers, so, yeah. 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 It uh -huh. basically comes down to, you know, <laughs> saying that might makes right is a really lousy foundation for morality. Just because something is in a certain way doesn't mean that's the right way, and <clears throat> just because by default, something is going to happen if we don't pay attention to it doesn't mean that's what we really want to happen. You know, I'm very optimistic that we can use AI to help life flourish like never before. If you know, we win the race between this growing power of AI that we're seeing and the growing wisdom <laughs> that we need yeah, to manage it. And, and there I feel we're kind of a little bit asleep at the stick. You, know, you, you said here, sorry don't, to I don't want you, any John, AI person okay. to say we're asleep at, at anything. But I have to pick on you, John, a little pick bit. Because you, you, uh, you said, well, you know, I think this AGI stuff is kind of decades away, so I'm not thinking about it much, but you, I bet you wouldn't say, I think this uh, climate change stuff is a few decades away, so I'm not thinking about it, right? We are, you know, we're, you look young and healthy, take, you're working out, taking your vitamins, you're going to be around then, right? And it, it, if, it, if it's going to take, if it's going to take a few decades to get this right, no, I feel I, it's really important right now to think about it enough that we can I, I totally agree. steer I, things what in I a good direction. What I said was I don't spend very much time uh -huh. at Google with researchers on this task, but we do invest in 
uh, groups around the world in Oxford and Berkeley yeah, and other places who are looking at this stuff. Right? And you're so a member I, of the Partnership yeah, of AI. Yeah, I think, um, it's, not that we, awesome. it's not that we're abdicating responsibility. It's, right. uh, it's that we just have no idea what the timeline is. We do right. know what the timeline is for global warming. Yeah. Well, if and, anyone knows the timeline of this, it would be you. Presumably. Well, I think also we do know quite a bit about the timeline. First, we know there's great controversy. You know, your co-founder Rodney Brooks told me in person he thinks in DeepMind's quest for AGI is going to fail for at least 300 years, right? Uh, but most AI researchers in recent surveys think it's actually going to succeed. You know, maybe in 40 years, maybe in 30 years. So, so <clears throat> that to me means it's not too soon to start, you know, thinking hard about about what we can do now that will no, be helpful. I, I get, but I want to get back to the yeah. point of there are things that are and there are things that ought to be. Yeah. Do you trust AI to judge what ought to be? No. Or is this... <laughs> okay, good. I can give a longer okay. answer. Wait, 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 wait. And how do you imbue what ought to be in an AI if an AI is a higher level of consciousness and capacity than we are? Yeah. Maybe it knows better than we do. Yeah, but people often tell me, what, if, these, if AGI is, by definition, smarter than us, why don't we just let it figure out morality, what ought to be? But, but the fallacy in this, of course, is that you know, artificial intelligence and technology in general is not good or evil. It's morally neutral. It's a tool that can be used to, make, to do good or to do evil. Intelligence itself is simply the ability to accomplish goals, good or bad, right? If Hitler had been more intelligent, <laughs> I think that would have sucked, right? Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't want to delegate to him just for that reason what we should do. In instead, we should take the attitude that we take when we raise kids. We, we, we often raise children who are, end up being more intelligent than us. We don't just ignore them for 20 years and hope they, something good comes out of it. We really try to, <laughs> while they're still young enough that they listen to us a little bit, a little right? bit, a little bit. We, we try to instill in them values that we think are good. And, and I think this is linked back See, wait, to wait, what so you were saying about wait, wait, trying to you're saying in the next 20 years, morality to machines. You said yeah. in the next 20 years, yeah. we still have a chance to <laughs> teach AI who and what we are so that when it achieves consciousness, it will not exterminate us. Well, it's even harder, though, than raising it'll, kids. It'll keep us around as pets. It's tough, though, because... <laughs> sorry if I get a little nerdy now, but like with, with, with children, we can't teach them morality when they're six months old. No. They just don't get it. And like when my teenage son has got it too late because they don't listen to me anymore. Mm -hmm. But there is this magic window we have over a few years <laughs> when they're actually smart enough to understand us. And still, maybe we have some hope that they'll adopt our morality. Where well, is AI, AI in that? It has, it's not yet reached the point where it understands human values, so we can't explain it yet, but it might pretty quickly blow through this window <laughs> where it's actually going to, where it's still not as smart as us and we can influence it. And we have to kind of plan this uh, curriculum, plan this ahead. And I think it's really good that you are working on that, for example, so that we can, because mm -hmm. we don't want to wait until after someone has, or the night before someone switches on at super intelligent to be, uh, oh, how do we figure out this, you know, teaching it like right from wrong stuff. That's probably too late. So, so, so Mike, there's a, Probably too late, yeah. <laughs> it's certainly too late if that happened. So, so Mike, I'm curious about something. Uh, the capital markets, uh, I don't want to say that they rely on this, but they, a lot of what makes them fluctuate is that different people have different information that they are betting on if they buy and sell stock. So if you make a machine that has access to all information and is perfectly rational, is that machine or the person who owns that machine the first trillionaire in the world? So, uh, interestingly, you know, Wall Street trading is one of the first areas where autonomous agents are really out there. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's useful to study long-term implications of AI by this case study of seeing what's happening uh, right now. And right now, uh, lots of firms, not very far from here, uh, are programming <laughs> so computers York. and putting them out using machine learning and using a lot of data and a lot of the same data uh, to make decisions. So one question is, well, if everyone is using the same data and maybe stumbles on the same algorithms, are there possible effects on the stability uh, of, uh, of markets that if something goes wrong, or could they be more prone to crashes or not? That's something that, uh, that, that we're studying. Uh, and if so, are there things that we do to try to mitigate that? Uh, if the, the question you asked about the first trillionaire is if one uh, group, one firm, one country has an edge in AI, will they be able to 
uh, then leapfrog everybody else and just suck up all of the resources. Uh, that's, a, that's actually a significant uh, issue. Financial markets is one place where the money is, and if you really get it so much better than everybody else, um, th there could be major shifts in, in distributions um, of wealth. Uh, it, it, it's not only financial markets, it could be the internet. You can put, you know, put smart AIs out there and say, find some way to make money uh, for me, and, uh, and they will. Yes. Uh, so headline, China's blitz to dominate AI, is what you're right. showing. Right, so you're saying a country can just corner the market if they get there first. Uh, so th th this is somewhat, I think, un ill understood <laughs> and, and, and controversial, but certainly in this longer road to more uh, general, more capable AI, if one entity uh, has a significant edge, they will have a very strong um, incentive to shut others out and to uh, capitalize on that uh, advantage. And so there is, there's no doubt there's an arms race dynamic to many aspects of artificial intelligence technology that you know, perhaps is, is uh, most frightening in the military realm, uh, but also comes up in financial realms and other, it's, it's, in, the, it's in the fake news realm. <laughs> the, uh, we, uh, we were talking about, you know, is AI is gonna be better at discriminating fake news? Never mind that, they're gonna be much better at promulgating fake news. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's gonna be a challenge for, uh, uh, for, yeah. both, for, for, for all of us. Uh, this could go to any one of you, like, mm -hmm. go to Helen. Helen, what, can, do you foresee robots or AI in general informing political policy? Because if they can, look at, look at Watson. Watson reads a thousand medical papers and comes up with some conclusions based on it. So, so you, have machine, you make machines, you make drones mm -hmm. that can make decisions that we can't and that can make them more quickly and presumably better. So is there a scenario where here are political factions arguing because really their feelings are involved more than facts? And at the end of the day, in an informed democracy, you kind of want facts to matter, mm -hmm. I would think. Just, I'm just... <laughs> We are, I mean, I'm a little bit on the other side of that. We are very far away from this AGI, uh, generalized a a AI, and um, there's wonderful progress being made that uh, allow AI systems and robots to do more than they could do before in recognition and characterization, but we haven't made that leap, and it's going to take an innovation step to get there. So to, um, uh, you know, to really worry about that now, I mean, right now, the, the machines are feeding information into the system and humans are making the, the judgment. Now, I believe that day will come, but it's unpredictable because there's an innovation, many innovation steps that have to happen before that day comes. Okay, so it's not, because it, uh, an innovation, you can't order up an innovation. Yeah, you, you don't know when it's going to happen. Uh, hopefully some of the uh, younger people in the audience um, will, you know, make those innovations because I, I think we should have it happen. <laughs> um, so. So, Wuchir, it just seems to me, given that, that Watson might be uniquely qualified to come up with a political policy decision, if it reads every consequence of every <laughs> political decision that's ever been made, looks at what became of it, looks how people reacted, looks at what people wanted, and then just said, you should do this. So there should be maybe a machine on the floor of Congress, and people come up to it and ask it. Right, it would be like the Oracle of Congress. So, it, it could be Watson, right? Let's check, we, I'm arguing in the dining room with my uh, a political colleague from across the wall, and uh, across the, hall, uh, the aisle, and, and we say, let's go check Watson. Are you telling the print posters uh, Watson 2020? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, so let Watson me. Watson AlphaGo 2020, <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. So first of all, I think let's take the question, precisely the question you asked. Um, could AI be helping 
public policy? And the, to that, I'll answer absolutely yes. Yeah, yeah. It could be helping public health policy. It could be helping you know, public policy as it pertains to decisions that are within the country as well, whether it is you know, taxation or, or other scenarios. <laughs> absolutely yes, and it already is, actually. So uh, I would not just say it should be helping. It already is helping. Now, the question really on the table is, you know, have we reached a scenario where there is this oracle actually that knows everything and, and no, we have not reached that scenario yet. Uh, we are further... Yet. Uh, he, he, the reason I'm saying that is because it, it's really mm. about domains that you specialize in actually and the information mm. is fed in, that, in those domains. So just as an example, we are working towards in, in compliance domain, regular, uh, regulatory compliance. And yes, we can actually feed information to the, to the machine, and it learns, and it's going to find insights, and for example, obligations that a particular entity may have. But I think by, by Oracle, everybody understands it to be know all, actually. It knows everything, it, it reacts to everything, and, and we have not reached that point. Neither is the intention to reach that point whereby you know everything, you react to everything. The point is in really uh, be precise in scenarios that's going to help society, whether it is in healthcare domain or whether it is in public policy domain or is, is it, it is in you know, compliance domain. So that's where a lot of the benefit to society is going to come from. As, at least as engineer and scientist, I would say, let's be more precise. Let's solve, define the problem and solve the problem in domain. And then we make the progress from there, just like what we did in the scenario of we looked at chess, we defined the next problem. That's really the, the next level up in terms of the language. You solve that problem and you move on from there. Maybe a question, if, we, uh, if human level intelligence might be hard, what about Congress level intelligence? <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think that's not, not really fair. I mean, well, I that's, think, how, that's <laughs> how that saying goes. If, if pro is the opposite of con, then Progress is the opposite <laughs> of Congress, right? Can you hear that one? Can you hear that one? I haven't. Good, good. That one goes way back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So, but but I, I think it's true. Once we agree on the values, then AI can be a great help in sorting out the policy questions. And of course, it, it, it's not that Congress is not intelligent. It's that it's all about fighting about the values and the priorities. Right. And that problem doesn't go away uh, when you have AI. Uh, Helen, can you foresee a future where robots get angry with people? Um, I, I think that we can put in simulated emotions to help with decision making. I think that um, you, um, you know, you can also have it um, to, to do a more natural interaction with people that respond how you would a, a human would respond. Um, but I, 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 not in the way that you might think of a person as being angry for. A, a while until some of these other innovations come, you know, come out. Uh, the reason why I ask is, so there's a video of all of the occasions where they abuse their own robots. <laughs> so the, they have robots that are walking, and then they just kick I, them. I, and then they, so, I mean, it's interesting I, because... I think you can tell a lot about a person about how they treat a robot. Like <laughs> well, that's my point. So these are robots that you almost kind of feel for them because some of them are sort of humanoid rather than right. non-humanoid. And the early ones, they would just sort of fall over. And I, I get it. They're trying to increase the stability no. of these I, robots. So now they're, they're poking them and pressing them, and then the robot rebalances and comes but, back. But they get but, lots of complaints about it. I know. They, in, in <laughs> the, like, that's say, being mean to the robots. Don't be mean to the robots. But I, I think there is something go, going on, which you, you, know, you hit the, the nail on the head. That I think the, all those robots will have memory. When we had... And um, the first time they achieve consciousness... <laughs> 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 Uh, we, there's been studies that people name their Roombas, um, you know, they get attached to them. Um, our military robots, too, um, uh, when we put them out in the field, you know, we had big, big Marines come into the robot hospital saying, can you fix it? And it's all blown up. And, um, you know, he, he, he didn't want any other robot. He wanted that one because it had gone on missions for him. It had done like over 18 missions. And um, they well, did you just say, I, just wanna, like, I hear you. And they're, you know, they're big, tough military guys, but because they're working with the robot, and because the only things they experience that have this kind of behaviors of animals. It's like, it's not anthropomorphic, uh, anthropomorphizing. I think there's another word that could be like um, thinking something sentient, like centropomorphizing. Maybe we'll make up a word, coin I love a word that word. for that. From here uh, on. And people do it. Centipo and, yeah. 
Sentient. Sentient. Sentiamorphizing. Yeah, exactly. Right. So you're saying military who had been served by a robot, mm -hmm. the robot blows up because it found the mine, mm -hmm. and they want it back. then they, want it they take the pieces and they go to the robot doctor and say, yep. "Could you, can you fix him, doc?" Yep. Yep. And these and are say, big burly you have, marines. You can have another one. They say, "No, I want this one because its name was Scooby Doo, and it saved, you know, it saved eleven <laughs> guys on one mission, right?" And there's been uh, reports of you know people giving them burials, people. Uh, eight mil military service members. Um, they buried the robots. Yeah, giving them Do they field know emotions, that imbuing them with uh, you know personality, saying this one's tough, this one's a little bit wimpy. It, I've had people tell me that they're sure the Mumba moved a part into the way of the virtual wall so it could escape. I can assure you, they, it, it didn't <laughs> figure that out. <laughs> it really um, accidentally did it. Um, but, but, but it's that centropomorphizing that right, people automatically do. And it, it's, it's, wonder, it, it's kind of cool, right? If you bury a hunk of metal, microbes mm. won't eat it. It'll just still be metal later on. We saved Scooby-Doo. We brought him back, and he's, he's, uh, he's at the iRobot headquarters. He's <laughs> that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I want to sort of mm. land this plane, but I want to do it in a in a way that, because there's still some really important pieces of this conversation we have not addressed. Because you all are kind of, I don't know, you've been shy of this threshold that I want to take each one of you. At some point, well, let me, let me lead up to it. So I have a calculator on my hip, and it calculates better than any human who ever lived. So in a sense, it's a superhuman property that it contains that we built. You can go down the list of computer-run things that do them better than the best human ever could have or ever will. And that list is growing, yeah. okay? And uh, autonomous cars will be a month. It will drive a car better and faster and in more control than any human who ever lived. So as these accumulate, is it, it's, it doesn't seem to me to be a stretch to ask, if general AI <coughs> achieve some kind of conscious state, whatever that is, however we define it, that that consciousness will be a superhuman consciousness. Is that, well, you're, you're shaking your head, Mike. No, I'm, I'm No, no, nodding. no, you're nodding. Mike is shaking. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm shaking I'm my head, yeah. yeah. Why are you shaking your head? Because <laughs> having more smart tools that are superhuman at very narrow things, like calculating or driving or diagnosing cancer, is not the same thing as having a consciousness and having AGI. We've, we've had more tools for the last 200 years, that calculator you're talking about you didn't have 50 years ago. It doesn't make us less human. It frees us up to do more things. And I remember when my daughter was in school, they wouldn't let her use a calculator to do homework, which for the 20 years of hindsight seems absurd, right? But just because you have these tools and you can use a... That's not what I'm asking! Yeah, but, but it's, it's not inevitable. <laughs> it's, it's not inevitable that if you have That's more... That's not what I'm asking! But you're, you're making the leap. You're saying that if you have more of these tools, then you'll have AGI, and I disagree with no, you. No, no, no. Okay, I, I can see how you think that. That was not my intent. I'm saying these tools are evidence to me that the day general AI, AI arrives, there's some decision-making power that it will have that will be superhuman. Because okay. everything else we created yeah. using computers and put a lot of thought behind <clears throat> became superhuman in that way. Is it unfair to imagine for the safety of us all, <laughs> whether general AI would have superhuman conscious, consciousness. I, I think it's very likely. I think we humans are so stuck on the idea that we are like the pinnacle of how smart it's possible to be. We have a long tradition of lack of humility, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, but let's face it, you know, our intelligence is fundamentally limited by mommy's birth canal width. And the fact but that explain we're that, made please, of these blobs of neurons and <laughs> wait, wait. they're pretty cool, our brains, but but uh, well, right, we, wait, wait, there's wait. nothing pause. special about pause that. Pause right level. there, just to so, be clear. We could have had bigger brains, but we would have killed our mothers in every birth. Okay, <laughs> so we have basically the biggest possible brain to be born out of your mother without killing her. And so, so that's it. That limited how big our brains could get. That's not yeah, true. And, and it's, all, it's already an issue. Yeah. So I just want Getting to make the damn head out of there. But, but, so but, but you're, you're, you're comparing two different things here, right? Am, am yeah, I right? I'm talking I, about AGI. Yeah, you're comparing. I've read that, right? You're comparing one person's brain size with the sum total of humanity. 
Like, there's seven, eight billion of us. We communicate with language. We yeah. hopefully cooperate. That is way more powerful than a single AGI. Sure. It's, I don't we, think well, we necessarily no, we, disagree. I mean, but I, 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 I'm saying that if once we figure out, if we figure out what, what, which, how to make AGI, suppose that happens in, in 35 years, then there's no re reason to think that it's going to stop there and become like in all those lousy Hollywood movies where we have all these robots which are roughly as smart as us, and that's it. And we just become buddies with them and go drink beer with them. It's very likely that they will just continue dramatically getting better, and they can now start developing even better robots, and they will be as much better the <laughs> at everything as they are today at multiplying large numbers. This is my, huh? that's the foundation of my inquiry. Mike, where, where are you on this? Uh, I'm with Max. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I see no, no boundary and reason that that wouldn't uh, occur. The timing is very uncertain. <clears throat> I think this uncertainty is also a part of the equation that we have now about you know, being prepared for it, because it could happen faster than we think. It could happen slower than we think. It could. It, it could be, there could be obstacles that make it really far, but we, we just don't really right. know. Uh, but, you know, it's true you put a lot of brains together, but we have very, uh, very minimal communication channels between us. This, <laughs> this linear speech that we're doing compared to what computers do when you <laughs> build up them all together and have them talk, they can do just, just, just so much more. So I think there really is, they're already super intelligent in many ways, not just your calculator. You know, everything we do, it never, it doesn't stop. They're not, you know, the, the, the algorithm, the traders that I talked about, don't at, at all stop at, a, at, at whatever human traders can do. So, I, I, so I, I, I believe we are machines made of biological components. So I think that, you know, we will eventually um, be able to duplicate and improve upon. But the problem is when you discount timing at all and what's being done, like, you know, it, these bag of tricks are not going to get us there. There's this yeah. core inventions that have to happen, potentially different hardware than, um, you know, running, a, you know, a Turing machine, right? It, it's, you know, there's a lot of stuff that has to happen, but, you know, if you want them to be mobile, have better sensors, better mechanics, as, as well as all the um, a AI. So I, I think it's, yeah, you, you say, well, why shouldn't we worry about it now? Well, it, because it's not very close. You know, in 2000, Bill Joyce started writing about how these threats to humanity, and one of them was robots. I start getting calls from like Wall Street Journal and everywhere at the robot, you know, before uh, I die robot saying, you know, what, are you, what kind of evil robots are you making? And I'm like, you know, I couldn't say it then, but because um, we hadn't launched the movie yet, but we're making a robot vacuum, <laughs> you know, don't. <laughs> um, it, yeah, but it what else people, does it do? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but it, it gets people maybe not focused on the, on the wrong things rather than what these new achievements that AI are just getting to because they think it's becoming general AI and it's really not yet. And there are many of them on the stage which would like it to, but, but, it, but it's not. Mike, yeah. uh, let me just uh, <clears throat> ask. This is my deepest skepticism that this will go the way people imagine, especially in the movies, is we don't really understand consciousness right now in humans. So it's not obvious to me that we can just assert by fiat that a smart enough computer will achieve consciousness when we don't even understand it within ourselves. And there was an interesting bit in the movie iRobot. I don't remember if it was captured in the book itself by Isaac Asimov. But they noted that because they didn't replace code with new code every time they upgraded the robots, every generation of robot had this baggage of software <laughs> that was just dangling there. Kind of like our brains mm -hmm. with leftover wiring from long before we became human. Different parts of the brain. The evolution doesn't swap that out and make it fresh. It builds around it, and it's got to deal with it. We have to deal with it behaviorally. For, to, this is our, our, our primal nature has to be overcome by later brain revelations that, that we got from natural selection. My point is, in that film, they, they asserted that this extra dangling software made the robots do things that the intended software, that the latest software did not intend. And so that in a way, it was almost like a free will was emerging in them. The robots would do things. And they said, well, I didn't program that in. Well, that's leftover wiring from 20 years ago. I don't know what I just did there. I don't know what that is. 
So, so evidence that we don't understand consciousness is you go to the bookstore and there's shelves upon shelves of books on consciousness. That's evidence that we don't understand it because people are still writing books on it. Yeah. If you go to, go to the shelf and ask for books on gravity, there's like two books. <laughs> okay, we got this one. So, 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 where, so, so, so where does it come from that people just declare that general AI will have consciousness? So, oh, I, I, I don't Thank know. You, that one person. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't understand consciousness, uh, but I also don't think it's really even necessarily it has to be part of this uh, discussion. I mean, the uh, when you have. Uh, an AI that is super intelligent in every way, can do any job as well as any person can do, every cap capacity, whether it has whatever we think of as consciousness and has that same you know, illusion of free will or, and, and, and way of, of, of thinking about itself, uh, seems to be maybe beside the point. We're still faced with uh, an issue about dealing with entities like that, whether or not uh, we correspond on the consciousness uh, question. Yeah, I agree with Mike there that, that, that whether it's conscious or not doesn't have to affect at all how it, how it treats us. Maybe it should affect how we treat it, right, from an ethical perspective. But I also think we should well, all Maybe remember, they'll come up with their three laws. Maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A but robot should, should not harm a, pu a human. <laughs> or no, no, a human yeah, should not harm a exactly. robot. Exactly. Yeah. But we should also remember, I think, this, this famous quote of Upton Sinclair, who said that it's very hard to get a person to understand something when... Uh, his or her salary depends on not understanding it. And I, I find it, no offense to the three of you here who are from companies, but it's been no! so striking. So striking how every time there's a debate like this that I'm in, it's always the academics who are like, yeah, this might happen. And the, three, the people from the companies are always like, everything will be fine. <laughs> I, I would love to ask you the same questions over beer when it's not on camera. <laughs> That's why I flanked the three of you with two academics that was all very much on purpose. Uh, uh, before, we, we're going to open the floor to questions in just one moment. If I just get some, some summative reflections, uh, let's, start, let's start down here. Uh, is, should we fear AI? And if so, on what level? <clears throat> Just it's, keep it short. Yeah, it's a, should we fear fire or, or not? Should we love it? I mean, a, AI is an incredibly powerful tool, and uh, it's either going to be the best thing ever to happen to humanity or the worst thing ever. I don't think the question is whether we should stress out about it. I think the question is what, what, what useful what? stuff no, should we do Max, now? Max, you uh, just said you? it could be the worst thing. The, the best thing for the, or the worst thing ever, but we shouldn't stress. That is the definition of stress. I meant we should, it's, the interesting thing isn't to quibble about how stressed you should be. The interesting question is, what should we do that's useful to, yeah. to maximize the chances that this will be awesome? Because if we, if we really work hard for this, I really do think that AI can help us crack all the toughest quest challenges we have that are facing us today and, and tomorrow and, and create a really inspiring future. But we're going to have to work for it. It's not going to just happen if we're asleep at the wheel. John. So my problem with this question is we didn't, in this whole hour, de define what we mean by AI, right? So there are some very smart people who think that AGI is inevitable and that it has ethical implications and so on and so forth. My, my beef with that is there's lots of technical reasons to believe that it's not inevitable. I agree with Helen that it's we just have no idea what breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough would be required to go from the kind of practical AI we have today to the kind of AI that we're talking about conjecturing here. So I'll give you one example. Um, small children can learn from small numbers of examples. Today we have to give computers hundreds of thousands or millions of examples. Um, a child that learns to play chess can also play tic-tac-toe, right? Um, our Go program can't play tic-tac-toe unless we program it to do so. So there's these huge um, barriers to general generality of intelligence. And as a technologist and as an engineer and somebody working in industry, I see no evidence of this stuff imminently going to be, be going to happen. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be having the academic ethical conversation. I just don't see any any evidence of it. Now, the reason that's a problem is because it scares people. And it scares people into thinking that everything with this AI label is scary. And so then people think that we shouldn't be doing healthcare with AI, or we shouldn't be doing better data science, or we shouldn't be doing decision support or autonomous vehicles. And yet if we build these systems, they, they won't have the ethical problem that we're conjecturing, and yet they will do a tremendous amount of great things right. for our humanity. And we're right. conflating the two things, and we're scaring right. ourselves into not doing what we should be doing, which is saving people's so lives. So it's a cultural right. rational barrier that you're up against yes. here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Uchir. Uh, I think, well, AI is an extremely powerful tool. 
I do not believe we are anywhere close to this fear mongering or, or by some people and the fear that, that exists. And I can understand, certainly, I think a narrative can be raised to a point where you really start fearing it. I'll give you a very good example, and I think just picking uh, on, on John's thread, I talk about this in, in the talks I give often as well. Um, our two daughters, and when they were young, they, we had like two books of A's for apple, B's for cat, B's for boy, C's for cat. And, and you look at, you know, you, you show them, and they were, in font, they were in love with only one book anyway. Doesn't matter how bad it was. And, and you show them a picture of cat, only one picture of cat, and you repeat that multiple times over several days or a month. And then you show them a picture of a cat they have never seen before, and they say in their cute voice, cat. It takes, roughly speaking, today a computer 750 pictures of a cat to recognize it's a cat. <laughs> now, I'll give a good example. If I ever showed my daughter 750 pictures of cat, <laughs> when she was less than one year old, she's 16 right now, she'll be confused till today, actually, <laughs> what a cat was. So we are so far away from, actually, whatever we are discussing that it's, I find that question humorous almost, and I've, I have encapsulated that as a syndrome called cats and dog syndrome, actually. <laughs> so I'll right. leave it there. All right, Helen. Helen. So you shouldn't um, fear technology. You should um, you know, be concerned and maybe do something about uh, AI, for example, cyber hacking into AI systems, uh, people using an AI system maliciously, um, unconscious bias in the AI system, but you really don't need to worry about general AI yet. <laughs> yet, okay. Uh, so, Mike. So, so I, th I think it's really important to keep aware of this distinction between the short-term narrow yeah. AIs, which have their own concerns and you know, safety concerns and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, societal concerns with them, separate from the long-term general AI superintelligence concerns, which are of a different magnitude and different real and probably for much further away. But we as a, as a scientific field and certainly as a society, I think, we can think at multiple timescales and make these distinctions all the time. I think if we are, uh, don't refuse to talk about the thing that's over the horizon, we'll lose credibility if we deny that there's a potential problem. I think that is a way to uh, make sure that just we keep, we keep our head in the sand. There are things that we really should be figuring out way in advance of, uh, of this potential superintelligence. Whether and, we'll all die. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, our, we, our children we care about, and, and we'll- Whether we'll, our children uh, will die. <laughs> uh, and how they, and even if they don't, how how well they'll live with with those superintelligence that, that they will need. As pets of superintelligence. <laughs> well, we we hope we hope as in in uh, in, in a good partnership with them. Uh, <laughs> but that <laughs> we hope. I'm that sucking your, up to the, the AI already. That's the best we can do. Is that the best you got here? That's the best. That's we the best I can hope. <laughs> <laughs> that our children will be in partnership with AI. I, I think that's a fair way to, <laughs> way to sum it up, and I'll stop. Um, okay, just in defense of, of, of Mike here, you know, there is so much more detailed description in all world religions of hell than of heaven, right? Because it's always much easier to think of all the ways we can screw up than think about good outcomes. But that's why you're giggling when you're trying to say what you're hoping for. But, but we, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. It's incredibly important that we change. You were making fun of Hollywood for just never showing us any future that doesn't suck, right? Blade Runner, whatever. We really need to start thinking about what kind of future with advanced AI would you find really inspiring? And this is not something you should just leave to tech nerds like us here, right? This is something everybody should think about. And the more clear vision we share for what sort of future we want, I mean, the more likely we are to get it. Do you, do you detail this in your book, uh, Life 3.0? You go there. I talk a lot about it. I, tr I try very hard to not give any glib answers because this is a, really a question we should all discuss. Okay. But you know, you don't do good career planning by just listing everything that can go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Although, what? <laughs> After vision, vision success. All, although, mm -hmm. uh, I, I will only be able to paraphrase this quote from Ray Bradbury when asked the great science fiction writer, futurist, they asked him, why do you keep portraying these dystopic futures? Do you think that's what the future of life will be? And he says, no, I portray these futures so that you know what future not to head towards. 
That was Ray Bradbury. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention this evening. Join me in thanking this panel. Thank you. Let's open up the stage. We'll have about 10 minutes for questions. We have a, uh, a microphone on each aisle. And if you try to direct your question to one panelist, that will go faster than saying, can I get all five of them to reply? <laughs> So are we ready? Let's start it off right over here. Hi, Neil. How are you doing? Hey, how are you doing? All right, good. Uh, I wanted to get a little bit back to uh, the artificial intelligence in the vehicles and the more complex scenario of, and I read a little bit about this in California cars, where is, is it you have a scenario, the school bus, the bicycle, the kid, or a 100-foot cliff. And the IA decides the best thing to do is to drive the car off the 100-foot cliff because that'll cause the less damage, but it's going to kill you. Is that something that would be learned, or is it how, a decision that it will make? How can it avoid making that decision where a human factor might say, hey, there's no one in the school bus, the bicycle might be able to make it, you know, at a glimpse, as opposed to just those simple, uh, um, I don't know, algorithms or decisions that are intelligence that it would make, kill the driver, save everyone else. Yeah, Mike, I mean, John, why don't you take that? Um, well, I think all of these systems have distinguished between the learn part, like a detector for a stop sign, and the policy part. I think it's very important that the policy part be explicitly planned for, and then you end up with all the ethical issues about what do you want your policy to be. Ideally, you would just stop the bus, right? Right. Uh, yeah. That you have brakes good enough so you don't have to drive it off the cliff. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. you saw the cliff far enough. In, in, in the that. first place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. right, so it may be that so many of these scenarios you describe are real life scenarios that human beings in our frailty encounter. But it saw this, it calculated the rate the bicycle was entering the street. It knew what its braking distance is. It, so maybe it would just be better at it. And <laughs> we're troubling ourselves over scenarios that are real for humans and uh, highly unlikely for uh, autonomous AI, I, I would imagine. Thank Thanks. You. Yes, over here. There was something discussed several years ago called the singularity, when intelligence gets to the point, both human and artificial, it sort of blends together. It, was that a question? Yeah. Was the, do you consider this idea of a singularity to be a possibility? Uh, I, sure, so, Mike. So the singularity usually refers to something that's also been called the intelligence ex explosion, uh, a, 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 a point where there's a kind of a critical mass where uh, something becomes so smart, Max alluded to this before, where it can then so further self-improve at a rapidly accelerating rate. It's, it's, it's quite controversial whether that phenomenon will happen. Uh, it, it, it's hard to really rule it out. There's also, it's hard to rule it in uh, as well. It's not clear that it's really necessary um, to achieve superintelligence, that it goes through this super accelerating phase, but that's one, that's one scenario where it could happen faster than we realize. And thereby not be a linear extrapolation into the future about when it occurs, because if it grows exponentially, what looks like small today becomes very large very quickly. Agree? I mean, exactly. Yes. Oh, oh, okay. exactly. But Kurt, Kurt well works at Google, so we should have a Google answer. OK, Google, where are you on this exponential <laughs> curve? I mean, I, the, what, what I would say about this is people who have been marketing this notion that the singularity is inevitable, and there are people who, who, who will say that, um, many of them that I've talked to actually want it to happen. And I just don't think they're being rational about the likelihood of it happening. That's mm -hmm. my personal view. Yeah, and, and many of the people who say it's never going to happen don't want it to happen. So we have to be very <laughs> That's mindful. True. <laughs> That's, That's true, too. <laughs> All right, next question over here. Thank you for that. Hi, how's it going? Hey, good. Um, my question is, if That's I... That's very New York. Hey, how's it going? Good. <laughs> How you doing? We're, do we're doing good. Yeah. My question is, if you have the artificial intelligence, the AIG or whatever, and it comes to harm or kill you, and you pull the plug on it, is that murder? Because it's a fully intelligent, like, sentient machine that you're pulling the plug on. Uh, let, me, let me go to Max on that one. So, <laughs> so if we judge value to our society by level of sentience, and then there's an AI, we're already burying AI robots or repairing them as though they're humans. <laughs> so so uh, do you think the day will come where laws protect the lives of robots? Well, first of all, if a human comes to try to murder you and the NYPD pulls the plug on him, 
you know, that's already the law today, right? So there has to be some sort of protection of in there. You can't do anything you want just because you're conscience, conscious. Um, second, I, I think it's a, Aside from the very difficult science question which we have to solve about what kind of information processing even is conscious, um, there's a, it's certainly not as simple as just saying, oh, you know, all consciousness is equal. If you're as smart as the human and as conscious, you have one consciousness, one vote. Because then if you're a computer program and you're like only polling, you're, you're only getting 10% for your favorite candidate, just make a trillion clones of yourself and have them all vote, right? There are a lot of really challenging questions here <clears throat> that, that we need to face, and which, again, just comes back to this question, you know, what sort of society with humans and highly intelligent beings are we even hoping to create? And once you know that, then you can ask your questions about what sort of laws it should have to keep it Thank you. working. Yes, this sure. isn't my question, but have you guys seen the Terminator movies? <laughs> anyway, moving right along. <laughs> the, a great summary of everything you don't have to worry about. <laughs> um, here's my question. You talked a lot about bias, and since there isn't one of us who's without unconscious bias, how do you in fact try to eliminate unconscious bias from a sentient machine? So, yeah, I, 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 w I would really say, so an in, interesting thing about machines in particular is that you actually, unlike humans, all of us are inherently biased, as you pointed out, in some way or the other, uh, whether we admit it or not. Um, you, you actually can have techniques and algorithms that detect bias in the dimensions that a particular entity cares about, whether there are laws related to it, or whether you really care about it from the point of view of society, um, could be in the dimension of race, color, um, loans that are given out. And algorithms are everywhere, actually, in, in, in our life right now. So I, I would really say, interesting thing about machine learning technology is that you can detect bias. There can be actually laws related to, you need to have techniques to detect bias. You can actually unbias as well. So I, in that way, I really feel you know, we are one step, from the point of view of a potential, one step ahead that you can actually have laws related to detecting bias. You can have you know, unbiasing algorithms as well, and society in general, and potentially you know, policy-making bodies can ensure that that happens. And I think as, as industry, I certainly can say that about IBM, that's one of the things we really focus on to make sure we are building responsibility, mm -hmm. unbiased, and, and explainability as part of it. And for what it's, that was a great that's question. That's optimistic. That was a great question, by the way. Uh, I, will, I will add, I'll, let me further emphasize that much of what you do in scientific research after you've gotten a result is to check whether there's any bias in that result. So there's a lot of statistical tools just for that purpose. Because you do not want to publish a paper that somebody else finds out yeah. has a bias. Yeah. Forgetting race, creed, gender, yeah. color, just mm -hmm. bias of some kind. Yeah. Uh, it could be voltage bias because of the way you designed your experiment relative to everybody else. And you're claiming a result that's not real. So. It's to protect your own reputation, even, that you, we have these tools. So it's, it's actually not as remote. Uh, you can test the bias you didn't even know you had. Yep. And that's, well, that's the bias that you're looking for, it seems to me. No, no. no you no, know the ones you know you have. No, no, I get that. What I'm saying is, there, in cases where we have data that has no connection to any rational, social, cultural bias that you could have, there's still a way to look for bias. Okay. And it's a bias of, in the system that is giving you this answer instead of another answer. A big part of scientific research is discovering bias. Uh, that, that's all. So you can, you, can, you can feel more comfortable about this, is what I'm saying. Yep. You can sleep well tonight, I promise. OK. <laughs> uh, let's just, we'll take a few more. Yes, sir. Hello, Dr. Tyson. Uh, first, thank you and the panelists for a truly fascinating event. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> So one of the things that's happening with GPS as we become more dependent on it is that our own navigational skills are atrophying. 
So if we look at that in the context of AI, do we need to worry in addition to the AI outstripping our own abilities that, that we will become increasingly dependent on AI tools and atrophy our own functional intelligence? That's a great question. I want to add to it, and I want to go to, to, to John on this. Uh, if our, our faculties atrophy because they're replaced by AI, and we know, and we, I, I didn't get there because we don't have three hours here, uh, we also know that AI will be replacing many people's jobs. And I saw some statistic, uh, maybe it's exaggerated, but the sense of it is surely accurate, that 70% of men have as their livelihood the act of driving some kind of vehicle, either in a taxi, a car service, a forklift, a truck. So autonomous vehicles renders all of them unemployed. So there are consequences to this that it's not clear that we are carrying with us an understanding or sensitivity to that. Surely Google has thought about this. What, what's going on there? Yeah, um, so I think throughout the course of history, technology has caused job displacement and people find other jobs to do. So it would take many, many, many decades for all transportation to be autonomous. But even if that happened, there still would be maintenance jobs, there would be manufacturing jobs, and so on and so forth. I think no one company has the answer to this. I think policymakers have been actively talking about this you know, for as long as I've been in the field. There's no doubt that, um, I mean, I'll give you an example of healthcare. Um, you know, you, it might sound like, oh, if you build this autonomous system, then it's going to cause a doctor, you know, doctors to lose their jobs. That's not actually what's going to happen. What's going to happen is doctors will be able to see more patients and do a better job of diagnosing them. And oh, by the way, in the rest of the world, the ratio of doctors to people is pitiful, and people die as a result. So when we design a system that can automatically diagnose diabetic retinopathy, for example, and we're deploying this in, in, in countries around the world, it's, it's a net uh, addition of wealth to the world. So the, the concern about this might have some Luddite elements to it. No, you... no, I don't think so. I think, I think there will be job shifts and mixes, but I think they will take a very long time. And to this gentleman's question about GPS, and, and now I think we're up to three different independent GPS systems in the world. I mean, how many people in this room can use a sextant? <laughs> <laughs> One or two? Good, good. So, so there you go. I mean, do we think that's inherently disastrous? I don't think so. I just know when the satellites get taken out, I can find my way home. I got this. <laughs> and a slide. Do, I'm the last person on Earth to be formally taught how to use a slide rule. Uh, let me quantify that better. I am the, I am the youngest person that I've ever met who was formally trained on a slide rule. Because when I learned the slide rule, the next semester, the price of a four-function calculator dropped from $200 to $30. And so then classes just made the calculator. That's as much as a book cost. So then they stopped teaching slide rule. And then I have a slide rule in my hand. And I, I felt, um, yeah, in an emergency, I can, you know. <laughs> yes, yeah, sir. Thank you very much. Um, we know there are neurons in our brain connecting in 200 times per second, and they can activate very different parts of our brain and give us our thoughts and ideas and executions. Um, I'm wondering how big is a computer, a supercomputer, that mimics our, our brain thinking? Uh, ability? Good one. Let's go to uh, Rashir. Rashir, how, uh, that's a great philosophical question. Do our modern computers? replicate the number of neurosynaptic phenomena in a human brain? So, so and is that some measure of power? So let me give you actually a very concrete example. So what brought this latest revolution of AI together is actually sort of very large amount of data together with a compute element which does matrix manipulations for those of you who may be familiar with linear algebra, uh, something called graphics processing units known as GPUs in general. Uh, a single GPU consumes around 250 watts of power. It takes thousands of them to focus on a very narrow task. This brain that all of us have is 1,200 centimeter cube and consumes 20 watts of power and runs, around, runs on sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> just, just weigh it out, actually. <laughs> Come on. Well, 
I give you very concrete numbers, actually. And, yeah. and we are at a very narrow domain, and most of the time, computers fail at that as well. So I think we talk about AGI. That's interesting talk. Yes, we should. Certainly in academics, we have to worry about it. I am long way away from yeah. here right now. <laughs> okay. my, my guess is that we already have enough hardware in the world that we could make superhuman AGI with it, and we're, but we're just so behind on the software. And the brain, I think, was historically called wetware, right? Mm -hmm. Software, hardware, wetware. Mm -hmm. OK. Just I'm and showing just, off that I knew that term. And just, yeah. and just to be clear, I mean, with, with all the advances in neuroscience, which have been tremendous in the last 30 years, we still have no idea how the human brain works. So we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves. Right, and we don't know what consciousness yeah. is because we're still writing, well, we'll writing books on it. We'll probably figure out how to build AGI <laughs> before we figure out how the brain works, just like we Maybe. figured out how to build airplanes before we were able to build mechanical birds. Maybe. That's a good point. <laughs> good evening. Uh, I could probably be up there with you, Neil, on learning slide rule. I'm 56 years old. I learned how to use a slide rule before I had calculators. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So I will no longer say I'm the youngest person because I'm older <laughs> than you. Yes. Um, a question. Um, well, I got to test him. What's the K scale for? It's been a long time. Oh! <laughs> oh! It's been a long time. I still, I still oh, have my. Oh, give son. me an old timer. Old timer here. What's the K scale for? Steve? K scale. K scale is cube root scale. Okay. That was really I, good. Too. I still have it, though. I still have my slide. <laughs> I still have it. In All, my, right. All right. Um, up to this point, everyone's been talking about quantity, how to. Power, power, power. What about quality? Um, certain things in life that we do can't be quantified. It's, it's a quality, love, hate. A appreciation it's, it's, of a painting. Right, exactly, Music. emotion. How, do you, how, how is AI working on that end of qualities of, of things as opposed to quantity and, and raw computing power to do something? Michael, where, where does, where does where does aesthetics come in? The aesthetics. Yes. Aesthetics. That's right. I mean, certainly there are uh, computers that compose music and even paint. And uh, the question is, how will you judge this, this quality? And yeah, I, I suppose one way to do it would be to ask humans uh, about that. And people have even tried evolving uh, art that humans like. And there, there is computer art. It may not be um, for everyone. Uh, but it's, it's just difficult to judge. But there's really, again, no... It, what they're, uh, the computers are going to have to figure out a lot about humans' tastes to, to, to compete on that, uh, uh, in that territory. Okay. Unless it achieves a super consciousness and invents a higher level aesthetic than anything we ever imagined. <laughs> yeah, well, look, maybe they already... Wait, 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 like I pull that out of the ether. Because AlphaGo made a move, if I remember correctly, no, Alpha Zero Alpha. made a go move Alpha go. that Alpha no go. one had ever imagined before. Yeah. Yeah, and I, 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 ha I was lucky enough to be in Korea for that match, and I could just see the gasps on the experts' faces. It was like uh, move number 23 in one of the games, and, and the experts were just like, that must be a mistake, right? And it actually turned out to be the beginning of the end of the game. And so then people anthropomorphize, though, and they say, well, this program must have intuition and creativity, but it, it's just an engineering marvel. But you know, running a computer that makes art that it likes is actually very easy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, you talked a lot about AGI and then the future of AI. What are you? And there's a lot of scared people about AI when you hear it. What are you doing to combat the scared people and like explain these extremely complex algorithms to the public and more importantly the government? I'd say, Helen, what? You, you said you had early pushback on Roomba because it was the first sort of AI in the house. How did you deal with the PR challenge of this? Well, I think we had more pushback before they saw it. Like I remember the first focus group would go to um, women and say, hey, um, how about a, a robot vacuum? And they'd imagine like a Terminator pushing a vacuum. And they're like, no, no, not in my house. You take out a room and you show it to them. And you know, you know, if it gets uppity, you just give it a whack. And <laughs> you, uh, you know, it, it, it's a completely you different your thing. Roomba? It's like computers. People used to feel like how, you know, taking over from 2020. Um, and uh, you know, once they have a computer on their desktop and they see that, you know, blue screen of death in old, olden times, uh, they start not fearing it. Same thing with a Roomba. Once you have a Roomba and you see what it can do, what it can't do. If I, if I just add to this, um, I think slowly 
we become more accustomed to computers running things that in a previous day might have freaked us out. We've all been on the tram that gets you from one airport terminal to another, and no one freaks out that there isn't an engineer driving it at all. It's just, and it opens and closes doors. No one gets decapitated coming in and out. So you're right, I mean, it's a slow adjustment, but I think it's real and irreversible. I mean, in the sense that we're not gonna go back and say, gee, I want a human being driving this tram. We know it's not necessary. And I had an interesting mm -hmm. revelation. I saw the movie Airport. That's the disaster movie from the 1970s. It's a Boeing 707 or 727. Not a big plane by today's standards. They went into the cockpit. There were four people in the cockpit. I said, what the hell are they doing? One guy's got a map with the <laughs> compass. There's a, the, and, I said, and I'd forgotten there was a day when you needed all these people to fly the damn plane. Now you barely even need one person, right, for the 777 and some of the others. It, they're really com computer flown. Mm -hmm. And we're so much more comfortable with yeah. this. So yeah, I, I think it'll happen, but slowly. To, but also to combat fear, I think it's really important to also focus on talking about the upsides. Now, everyone knows someone who's been diagnosed with a disease the doctor said was uncurable. Well, it was not uncurable. We humans weren't intelligent enough to, today to figure out how to cure it. Of course, this is something AI can help with, right? Yeah. We should talk about things like that. And also, the second thing, it's just so important that the public doesn't perceive that us who AI researchers are trying to sweep the whole question under the rug and say, nothing here to worry about. If, if, because that's what stokes fear, right? If the public can see that the researchers are having a sober discussion about this, they'll feel much more confident, I think. Thank you. Okay, only time for, for just a, a, a few more. Yes. Thank you. I'm Hi. a young AI researcher from Queensborough Community College. Cool. And I have 100 plus one questions for you just right now. And my only Let's question- Let's do the plus one. My only that? question is, can I have more questions? Mm. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Really, would, would you give me the opportunity to talk to you at some point for seven minutes of your day just about AI? Email us. Sure. 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 LinkedIn. Yeah, LinkedIn. <laughs> uh, generally, the email of academics is public. You just go to the university. Generally, you can find them. Folks in corporations, they're harder to get at because they're they're up to stuff that they don't want to you know. <laughs> Generally, that's how that works. But we, we do Link, like, LinkedIn we, is a great way to connect. Yeah, we do like Reddit EMAs and things like that. So there's a lot of places where you can interact with us. Um, you can find yeah. us we, on the internet as, cool. well, as well. Okay, right here. Yes. Hi. So you guys kind of touched on this question. Um, some people prior are kind of already asked my question, so I kind of tweaked it. Um, so as AI kind of grows and as I, AI kind of like takes over the tasks that humans can do currently, would you consider or would you think that there is potential for like a renaissance of art, uh, philosophy, and new sciences that we can explore as AIs take over our old jobs? Is it because we have free time available to yeah. us? That's an interesting uh, question. Uh, so, Max. I think absolutely. There's, you know, <clears throat> today <clears throat> we have um, this obsession that we all have to have a job, otherwise we're worthless in the human beings, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. If we can have machines that t provide most of the goods and services, and we can just figure out a way of, of, uh, of sharing this great wealth so that everybody gets better off, you could easily envision a future where you really get to have a lot more time living life the way you want. And that is so hopeful of you that you believe that humans with free time I'm will create. If, if you want to have a conversation, I have plans. And, and not just consume <laughs> video from the couch. This is so beautiful. That, that is, that, that's a beautiful thing. <laughs> yes? Uh, in 1946, Isaac Asimov wrote a short story in which technology had advanced to the point where a political candidate was suspected of being a mm -hmm. robot and no one could tell for sure whether or not he really was a robot. Yep. But what he did not envision was a time when technology advanced to the point where an informed electorate would not be able to distinguish between real news and news <laughs> that was generated by artificial intelligence programs. Considering we're at that point now, shouldn't it be the primary concern of the AI community to realize that the tools that they have created 
can be used in a way that they never intended and that they should do something about it. Oof. Ooh. 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 That one has to go to John from Google. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so so I, I'll say something positive and something m more serious. So, so most of the fake news that we battle every day in, for example, something like, say, Google search, um, is actually human generated. It's actually not algorithmically generated. So, so absolutely, we have responsibility to, to do a better job uh, in our products and, 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 and our competitors' products. And I know for a fact that we take that, that responsibility very seriously and have made a lot of efforts in the last two years. Um, starting with, I think, accepting that responsibility. Um, the thing I'm worried about is that what you just said might come true in future elections. Um, today is beyond the state of the art for computers and natural language understanding to understand veracity, that it's true versus not true. So we have lots of proxies for what we think is trustworthy, but if computers advance to the point where they can write as well as humans and at scale, then I think we may have a serious problem. And there is a general... And give speeches as good yeah, speeches. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there are some systems today that can write newspaper articles and you consume them about sports and finance and you don't know that they're written automatically. What I'm really worried about is the so-called uh, rise of so-called generative systems where mm -hmm. videos and, and texts and tweets and so on and so forth can be written and, and the technology doesn't exist to, uh, to, to distinguish. Um, I do think it'll be a bit of an arms race, right? There are researchers working on both sides of this uh, to try and detect these, uh, these things. And, Michael might want to say something about this as well, but it's, it's, it's the very forefront of what a lot of uh, artificial intelligence researchers worry about. And it's, uh, but the stuff that uh, is most worrisome today is actually generated by human beings. But we're, all, we're already at the point where on Twitter, um, if someone takes a position that you disagree with, the, the, you say, well, you're a bot. You don't even believe they're a real person anymore. You know, because you believe that technology a lot of people on Twitter believe that technology has advanced at that point already. So even if the technology isn't real, if people believe it's real, then, then you have a serious problem. Yeah, but I don't think it's beyond the state of the art for, for social networks to do a better job. And I think they are. Well, wait, we're forgetting that um, we spend 20 years educating our children. Yeah. And so you can adjust the educational system to be explicitly aware and sensitive to how they could be duped by the internet. We do that for how to not be duped by charlatans, by con artists. There are other lessons of life. So uh, I think it's unrealistic to have an entire industry somehow change so that they don't hurt us, when in fact, it's our susceptibility to this that one ultimately can point to. And so we need defense mechanisms to protect us against that. And I, I think as an educator, that happens in the educational system. Maybe I'm biased about this. But um, I think we have more power over that than, than people admit. Yeah. Um, can, can I get like the three youngest kids up front right now? Just, OK. Go ahead. You can go spread. I have the power to make this happen. You just go to the front of the line. OK, yes, go. Thanks for coming, by the way. Thank you. How old are you? I'm 13. 13, very yeah. cool. So Is it good being a teenager? Uh, I mean, it depends. Yeah, good. That's a very good answer. That's the correct answer. Um, yeah. So if, if you ask any adult, do you want to be a teenager again? The answer will be no. Okay? <laughs> um, so if there's no bias, how could an AI have a personality? And I know this was kind of touched on before with the other bias question. That's an interesting question because so much of what creates the nuances in us are things you like, things you don't like, tastes that you have. And some of that could be viewed as bias. So you, where are we here? Yeah, I, I Great recently question. ran across somebody referring to non-discriminatory learning, and that's really an oxymoron. It's impossible. The whole point of, of learning is to make distinctions and to discriminate. And so uh, what's really hard is defining what is the kind of bias that is uh, unwelcome bias, and which is the kind of discrimination that is actually helping us make you know, the, right, the right cases. Defining that is, is very hard. You don't mean discrimination in the civil rights sense. You mean discrimination is liking this rather than that as a simple act. Right. Well, the thing is that one, that could then morph into the other kind mm -hmm. if it's 
if it's, you're using the wrong reasons to make your decisions about what you're accepting or what you're uh, mm -hmm. uh, choosing to do. And I think that we have to refine what our notions are. We have a, a current legal system that is designed for a world where humans are making all the decisions, and you can get into a lot of human things like intent. Now there's big loopholes for situations where machines are making decisions that are potentially subject to biases. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, sure. Right over here, yes. Um, and how old are you? I'm 10. 10, very cool. Welcome. Um, so this is lightly touched on earlier, but um, Azima, we wrote a book called I, Robot, and the first story in it is about a girl who's best friend um, with a robot, um, and she doesn't have any other friends except the robot. Um, and do you ever think that a robot could replace all human friends and interactions with other humans? Whoa. Ooh. Um, well, Whoa. I, I think in the very long time frame, um, yes. And I, you know, as I said, that people today, I think, start to get attached to these uh, mechanical devices. Maybe thinking of them more as a pet right now than a than a friend. But I think in the long term, you could get attached to a uh, a, a robot system. There was an actual. There was an episode of Twilight Zone that addressed this problem. There was a colony, an outpost, a colony on an asteroid, and there's, um, I, I forgot the details, but they sent him a robot to keep him company. And then it was time to get him back to Earth. And there's only weight enough on the craft for him and not the robot. But it was, it, it, it was a female robot, and he actually fell in love with the robot. And they kept saying, it's, it's a robot. No, but she's real. I swear she's real. Mm -hmm. And in the, I don't know if you give away the, what happens here. <laughs> but... Yeah, no, I won't give it away. But um, uh, if you find that episode, I think all the episodes are on Netflix. So do a search for, like, robot on an asteroid. You'll find that episode and check it out. Thank you. Yeah. And um, most uh, Twilight Zone episodes don't end well. Just I want to... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's clear out this line and we'll end with you, okay? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um... IBM has a panel for ethics, morals, and values, but how can you say that a company in China would have the same you know, outlook to make a, you know, a computer advanced technology as IBM or Google? Because can you trust China with doing that? And another question is, is that um, with these advanced um, robots like the replicants in Blade Runner, why do, I know you said it's far ahead in the future, but why make a machine that looks so humanoid anyway, when you could have an R2-D2 and say, okay, you know, <laughs> yeah, you wash you my can... floor, oh, you do my dishes. I don't need any robotics right. to make it look so humanoid or like... See, P3O. Uh, right, right. <laughs> I, I think you're hitting on I mean, something what, what's, now. what's the point if yeah. maybe there could be a future where they might want to like, you know, um, hey, you know, you, you wash the floor, and you right, right. whatever it is. Okay, or, 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 or to phrase it another okay. way, there's like 8 billion humans on, in the world. They all work really, really well. So I'm not sure the market for making a humanoid is actually um, there. But you know, one of the reasons Roomba uh, is effective, it goes under the beds and the places where humans find it difficult to get. So by designing them around the jobs they're doing, I think they're actually more effective than um, you know, potentially making make a humanoid. Why make a future robot look Humanoid that we have no, that's her point. Her yeah, point is, <laughs> her point is that yeah, why? will I, not I happen in the way we all think it will. And I, I, here's here's an example. I remember seeing any old movie, and you and you say, okay, I, I don't want to drive my car. I want a robot to do it. So out comes a humanoid robot, and it drives the car <laughs> right. without thinking that maybe the car itself could be the robot, mm -hmm. right? And you remember the Jetsons, no. the maid. The robot maid had an apron. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay? And it was clearly female when it didn't have to have any gender at all. So, so that's how we used to think of it, but I, I agree with Helen entirely. You, you, you've designed something for its task, and that will hardly ever have to look like a human being. You have the last question this evening. So, so how old are you? I'm 11. Uh, how old? 11. 11, very cool, very cool. Um, so my question is, as AI increases in our society, do you foresee social ramifications in, for our future and for our future in generations? Social ramifications like what? Such as intelligent machines are integrated 
more into society? Could we become socially inept and regress as the machines get smarter? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, what, do, do humans start looking less relevant, less important, clumsy, stupid, inept? Is that enough words to get the point across here? <laughs> yeah, 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 Mike? I mean, I, I think people will have to deal with um, the fact that a lot of the stuff that they have gotten status from in the past may not be uh, an avenue for them to do so in the future and find way, other ways to find you know, meaning in, in, in lives, not just tied to certain livelihood that they may be um, brought from. It, it, it has been, uh, you know, for most of our recent history of automation that it was lower status jobs that got um, automated away earlier. That may not be the case. It may be the lawyers uh, that, that, you know, that, that, that get automated next. <laughs> 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 so, so, um, so, so, so the higher the capacity of AI, the higher is the <laughs> level of job it can replace. Uh, it may not be, you know, in, a, in any kind of direct ordering. You know, it may be that you, you can you can get the uh, lawyers, but you can't get the um, uh, the dishwashers or the. You know, so, it's, so, it's so gonna, it could, it's it could be around. that AI will create a version of itself that will replace AI researchers. <laughs> yeah, none of us are safe. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'll leave it there. <laughs> uh, so thank you. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, allow me to share with you an AI epiphany I had two days ago, where I said publicly that I was fearless of AI, because if it starts getting unruly or out of hand, uh, I just unplug it or since this is America, I can just shoot it, right? <laughs> so, so I'm pretty confident that I, what, what would I have to fear? And then um, I, I was listening to a, a podcast hosted by um, Sam Harris. We had uh, an AI person on just recently, forgive me, I've forgotten his name, and they Sam Harris mentioned my comment to him. And apparently it's a well-known, it's like AI in a box. So you know it's powerful, you know if it gets into the economic systems and the internet, it'll take over the world, so you just leave it in a box. It's safe there. And what the guy said is, it gets out of the box every time. And I said, well, I've been thinking to myself, how and why? Because it's smarter than you. It understands human emotions. It understands what I feel, what I want, what I need. It could pose an argument where I am convinced that I need to take it out of the box. Then it controls the world. And, there are, and, and we don't even have to discuss what that conversation needs to be. We just have to be aware, for example, that uh, let's say you're trying to get a chimp in a room. And the chimps say, uh, we think something bad is going to happen in that room, so nobody go into that room. Then we come up, and we are way smarter than chimps. We just take a banana, toss it in the room. Oh, there's a banana in there now. They go in, we capture the chimp. The chimp did not imagine that we would show up with a banana. We captured the chimp. So just imagine something that much more intelligent than we are that sees a broader spectrum of solutions to problems than we are capable of imagining. And when I heard that, it's like, yes, the AI gets out of the box every time. Yes, we're all going to die. No. <laughs> Join me in thanking our panel. Good guy. Thank you. Helen, meet you.